Beautifully and wonderfully made from Psalm 139 and verse 14. Uh, so we said this morning that tonight we were going to be talking about how the human body was fearfully and wonderfully made by God, every one of our bodies. Uh, the psalmist David said this to God in Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. He said, Lord, for you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Verse 15 and 16 says, My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. So we talked this morning about how at the time of conception, God is ready to put a new human spirit in the mother's womb to begin forming an earthly body around this new spirit that he's placed there. The new spirit is created by God and placed in the mother's womb. And so the, that body will be the spirit's temporary vessel as he or she walks the earth for the next 50 to 100 years, sometimes more. Of course, death is the spirit's putting off of the earthly shell and returning back into God's possession. Death is a separation of the spirit from the body, James chapter 2 and verse 26. And note that in our main passage tonight, Psalm 139, David interestingly says that his name was written in God's book when he was, quote, yet unformed. I want you to think about that in verse 16. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written. Uh, to take very special note of the fact that before a little baby's body is even formed, God writes that baby's name in his book. And we take that to be the book of life that you see throughout Scripture. The book of life is the book in which God keeps track of the human race, of human beings. No human being comes into existence without being logged in this book. It's the same book that will be open on the Judgment Day uh, to see who will get to enter into heaven, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12. The abortionists argue that uh, someone does not become human until they come out of the mother's womb. That's when they become a human. And then, then we shouldn't take their life. However, God's Word says a spirit is logged as a human being before that, body, that baby's body is even formed. That's very important to understand. So this is why it is biblical and logical to conclude that taking the life of a young fetus is certainly the murder of an innocent human being who's already been written in God's book. From this passage, we conclude that God puts a new human spirit in the mother's womb at the time of conception, a spirit who does not belong to her. It's a different spirit than hers. And then a new body starts forming around this new spirit in the mother's womb. So when the women say today, some of them say, my body, my choice, it's not the correct logic, and it is not their body. Yes, David said, I was written in your book, Lord, I was a human before I even had a body formed around my spirit. So in this passage, we also read that David said to God, you formed my inward parts. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about tonight. Well, what are inward parts that we're talking about? Surely David is referring to the things underneath the skin of his body. We're talking about David's heart, David's lungs, his stomach, his kidneys, his blood vessels, his bones, his muscles, and so on and so forth. David said, God, you put me all together. You fastened me. This morning we mentioned that a mother actually plays very little role in the actual formation of the baby in the womb. We joked that a mother and a father know how to place the order with a nine-month wait, but that mother does not consciously, does not purposefully craft this little baby in and of her own volition and with her own power. The Bible teaches that God has programmed a woman's body to host this ever-forming child after the moment of conception, and it's actually God's work. David said about his time in his mother's womb, he said, Lord, you covered me in my mother's womb, and it was there that I was made in secret, skillfully wrought, carefully put together. Our theme verse in verse 14 says, my soul knows this fact very well. 
but I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The word fearfully, when translated from the Hebrew, means to be done with great reverence and heartfelt interest, done with respect. The Hebrew phrase, phrase wonderfully made means that you were made unique, set apart. So the idea when you put these two phrases together, fearfully made and wonderfully made, mean God took it very, very seriously when he made you and when he made me in our mother's womb. He did it carefully. He did it full of thought. He did so with respect and honor, heartfelt interest for each individual that he made. And he knew you. He actually cared about what he was doing when he was forming you. And when he made you, he made you distinct and special from everybody else. And again, the idea in the original Hebrew language is to be distinct, marked out, separated, distinguished from others. Have you ever thought about how no two people are exactly alike? Even physically, right? Sometimes you, you get identical twins who share the same biological makeup from one another, but you spend enough time around them, you can tell them apart. Uh, this passage says, God made you and you specifically to be distinct from every other person on this planet. So the idea here is when God made Jason Toy, there had never been a Jason Toy before him, and there no, never will be another one after him. There ne there's only one Ben Porter. Someone could have the same name as them, the first and last name, but the individual is entirely unique. David said, God made me fearfully. That is, with such deep respect and conscientiousness for what he was doing, and all of this, my soul knows it very well. So tonight, I want you to consider specifically how awesome God's design is in the human body. I love Christian evidence-type sermons, which help to give evidence of God using science. And although we're mainly going to focus on the human body tonight, there are a few other elements of creations uh, that I'd like to start with just briefly before we move on to our main point, which is the whole human body. So we talked about before, if we look at a few creation elements, how perfectly fine-tuned this earth is for life to be here. Number one, we've studied that the earth is the perfect location away from the sun to host life in what's called the habitable zone around the sun because at this precise distance away from the sun, liquid water is actually able to exist on a planet, which is very important. Any farther away from the sun, uh, water would stay frozen. You wouldn't be able to have it in this form. Any farther away that, or any closer, it would evaporate in intense heat. So yes, water is essential to all living things. It is something you have to have if something's gonna live. Everything revolves around water, so you can't have life without it. So Earth is literally in a sweet spot. And uh, if life is going to exi exist, exactly 93 million miles away from the nearest star, which is the sun, just perfect. Number two, the Earth's precise distance from the sun is also just the precise distance for photosynthesis to take place in plants so that we can eat, right? No plants means no food. No food means no humans. And again, if water weren't here, plants wouldn't exist either. So there it goes back to that exact distance from the sun. Number three, Earth also just happens to have an atmosphere that is entirely breathable. Not only is oxygen the oxygen level perfect, but it is continually replenished by the plant life on the Earth and other mechanisms, which keep the oxygen level where it needs to be. You would think that oxygen could run out because humans and animals and different uh, th living things use it up and we take it in. But luckily we have the plant life and other mechanisms that keep producing more and more oxygen to keep it always at the right level. We always have precisely 7% of our Earth's atmosphere as oxygen. In fact, the plants in this Earth actually breathe in what we breathe out. Isn't that amazing? Uh, and we complement each other. We, we, as humans, breathe out carbon dioxide, but we need oxygen. Plants breathe our oxygen, and they need what? 
carbon dioxide. One website said, in one year, a mature tree will absorb more than 48 pounds of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Think these things have a function for human beings? Just the perfect little machines on the earth so that we're able to breathe. Oh, and by the way, the plants also need the perfect atmosphere that we are talking about uh, set in place in order to keep existing themselves. Right? And we could look at the nitrogen that's in the atmosphere just perfectly. And that's what helps keep these plants going. So one of my questions that I often, if I'll throw it at an atheist, I'll ask, well, which would have to come first? The perfect atmosphere to sustain the plant life or the plant life to sustain the perfect atmosphere? Which one came first? Chicken or the egg kind of thing. Because you see, you cannot have one without the other. And that means they both would have to be placed together at the same time in order to exist at all. They both need each other. Otherwise, how could one of them exist without the other? So do you see that the evidence shows a careful design? Evolutionist Carl, uh, Dr. Carl Sagan has estimated that the chance of life evolving on Earth is not even close to one in a million. But it is actually one times ten to the two billionth degree chance that life would form. So that is one followed by two billion zeros. So that is the chance scientists say that we have to be alive, and yet here we are. I read another article entitled, Earth may be a one in 700 quintillion kind of place. That means that of all the study of outer space that they have done, they have found seven quintillion other places of the size or the nature of Earth that's seven followed by 20 zeros, and not one of them matches Earth's circumstances, as we've been talking about. You know, if it weren't for Earth itself, a scientist would have to say that life was impossible because they've never seen it come from non-life. Uh, but because we exist and planet Earth exists, they have to say, well, it is one in 700 quintillion chance that it happened. Well, why, why do they have to put it that way? Well, because Earth exists. Otherwise, they would say it's impossible. So do you see the evidence that points to the fact that we would not be here if God didn't put us here, like the Bible says? That's what you can see by looking at science and things of that nature. So now let's focus on the same type of attention for the rest of our lesson tonight on the human body. Now that we've looked brief briefly outward, and there's so many things elsewhere that we could look at out there, uh, evidence of God's design. You could look at animals and uh, just the way the world operates. Now let's look inward. And we're going to study the human body tonight, and we'll find that the chances of us being alive the way that we are is zero to none if God were not in the picture. So I have ten points for the rest of our lesson, uh, and the points are the ten different systems in the human body. And we'll talk about each one. And we'll talk about how all of these collective systems have to be working at the same time in order for each one to individually operate because they go off of each other. They fuel each other. So one cannot stand without the other. That's an element of design. So to me, really, if you study this, the human body is one of the most obvious elements of design in all of creation. Just uh, take a look at yourself. Take a look at your body. So number one, we will go ahead and start with the structural framework by which all the other systems of the body attach themselves, the skeletal system. Uh, as the basic framework for why you can stand up, bend over, lift something that's heavy, and you don't flop over like a jellyfish, your bones make up your innermost structure. A hard, bar-like system has been set as the framework internally around which the rest of the body systems are going to wrap around and attach themselves. One website said, uh, the skeletal system works as a support structure for your body. It gives the body its shape, allows movement, makes blood vessels, provides protection for organs, and stores minerals. If you think to that, about that second to last part listed there, that it says it provides protection for your organs, have you ever thought about uh, just how awesome the rib cage is on the human body? You know, placed around the vital organs, the most important organs of your body, which is your heart and your lungs, is literally, as scientists call it, a cage of protection. 
which keeps any impact from directly landing on those vital organs inside there. You know, I remember when we used to have, you know, before we did the parking lot, uh, we used to have that old well pipe out back. Do you remember it? And those three metal beams sticking up out from around the well pipe. Why were those metal beams placed so carefully around that little well pipe? Well, it was to prevent an impact. A car from colliding into that pipe, breaking it, and the water would start spewing everywhere. So it's a protective barrier. Listen, if someone collided directly with your heart or your lungs, like a baseball or a rock striking directly, or somebody hits you or bumps you hard enough directly in the lung or the heart, it would have the capability of killing you within minutes. Right, with a hard impact. So, hey, good, good thing evolution so carefully came up with the rib cage. A sarcasm. Good thing random chance came along and put up a fence around your vital organs to protect them. I just say, are you kidding me? Notice also, you look at the rib cage, this cartilage in the front of the rib cage that makes these protecting bars around your vital organs movable. Inflexible. If you think about it, you would not be able to breathe if these were just hard, stationary things. But God designed it so that you could fill your lungs with air. And it was flexible. A flexible cage. So I guess we're lucky that this happened by random chance too, aren't we? After my son Eli was born, I took notice of how small his little skeleton would have to be underneath his skin. I looked at his little fingers and studied his little toes. And I thought about how tiny those little bones are in his hand. If you think about the human finger, just one finger, right? there are five different moving parts in one of your ten fingers. Right? Giving your hand such a, if you think about it, a really wide range of motion. All the stuff our hands are able to do. The way that our ten fingers are put together in the human hand makes it so that you can pick things up, scratch your back, Turn the pages of a book. Right? We take for granted how much we use our hands from day to day. And what a constant function they have. Sometimes a person breaks their arm. And they're wrapped up in a cast and they're not able to use one of their hands for a couple months. And then they realize, man, I use my hand a lot. Can you imagine living life without your hands? Can you imagine living life without the mobility in your arms or your legs? Yes, God was so smart, and this is all so functional. By the way, while still on the skeletal system, do you know what the smallest bone in the human body is? Uh, it's actually a little bone. In, actually, I went backwards. It's a little bone inside your ear that is the smallest bone in the body. That placed just right, uh, help to perceive, help us to perceive sound correctly. There's actually three really tiny bones, and if I point over here, this is the smallest one, called the stakes. And it is really, really small. And if we look at this and the function of what, when these are placed together, that they can, it can help us to hear. Um, I'm glad that this happened by random chance too, aren't you? I'm glad the universe randomly put that together of its own accord so that you could hear the sermon tonight. How silly to think that this design put itself together. Uh, number two, we keep going on to the next systems. We have the muscular system. Your skeletal system wouldn't do you much good if it weren't for the muscular system. Even though the arrangement of your bones give you your range of motion by which you can move, those bones would have no strength by which they could move if a fine layer of muscle wasn't attached to them to help them move. We talked about how the bones in your fingers help you to wrap your hands around an object so that you can pick them up. But if there were not muscles and tendons expanding and contracting to move your bones, your fingers would have no way of lifting anything up at all. You wouldn't be able to use your bones if it weren't for your muscular system. Intricately placed around all your bones are a series of muscles and tendons like rubber bands around your whole body carefully placed there, they can expand and contract at your command to pull something or to push something with a contraction. You know, so I ask you, what good would the skeletal system be without the muscles? 
Adversely to that, what good would the muscles do you if you didn't have the skeletal system? Imagine if you could instantly separate someone's muscles from their bones and take their bones right out of their body. What would happen? Very quickly, your whole body would look like a squid on the floor and it would fall and just become a loose mess. You wouldn't be able to stand up. You wouldn't be able to move the way you are if you were only muscle. So that's what helps us to stand and move around. So I also uh, want to make sure that when we're in this section talking about the muscular system, that I don't forget to talk about the human eye. Because yes, the eye is made up of tiny muscles that, to help, that help it function, and it is a muscle. One website said there are six muscles that attach to the eye to move it. These muscles are attached in the eye socket and move uh, and work to move the eye up, down, side to side, and rotate the eye. So here's another question. Do you ever take your, your vision for granted? Being able to look to your left or your right, up and down, side to side, you look all around and how beautiful this world is. As you are observing this beautiful world and taking the, in the image of another human's face, understand that behind the scenes, under your skin, little muscles are expanding and contracting to move your eyeballs for you at your command. So I've heard someone say before, the human eye is all the evidence you need to believe in God. If you only study the eye, it should convince you, yeah, there's a designer. The eye is one of the most complex systems in your whole body. And for, the most, for most of us, I would say it is probably the favorite of our five senses. I don't know what I would do if I weren't able to see anymore. Consider how the eye works when a bright light hits your eye. And the little muscles called the, the little muscle around the, uh, the pupil called the iris pulls a shade down, if you will, and limits the amount of light that comes in so that you don't blind the whole eye and harm your eye with light. So it's like if you're in your living room and you have blinds, and when the sun is shining in really brightly and it shines right in your face, and you gotta go over to the shades and you can just pull them down so it's not so bright, that's literally what's in your eye, automatically, all day long. And it's just so cool. And actually, if you look at, we don't often see eyes with their irises fully open. Sometimes people go to the eye doctor and they'll put one of those drops in and it looks strange, but that's actually what we look like in the dark when we're trying to see, but we never see it because whenever you take a picture, there's a flash, so you never get to see that. So it looks kind of weird. So don't even ask me to explain to you how it is that God has made us to see out of these eyes. It's so complex. Uh, it's just the most amazing element, in my opinion, of the whole human body. I've heard it explained in anatomy classes at college that the image of something enters into your eye and it reflects actually upside down on the back of your eye, which is the retina, and then the retina and the nerves attached to it sends signals back to your brain so that you then receive the image right side up. Your body corrects it for you. And so I say, how could this happen by accident? And, you know, if you study photography and things like that, they try to mimic that process and how it can work to put an image on something. And they look at the human eye. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 12 says, The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. Recently, I was also amazed by a temporary organ that a woman gets inside her body during pregnancy, and it is called the placenta. It is, its purpose is simply to provide oxygen and nutrients to a growing baby. We've been talking about the womb. This is the backbone of the womb, I guess you could say. And by the way, she doesn't have, a woman doesn't have a plac the placenta any other time. During labor, the uterus contracts and contracts, pushes that baby down and out. And ask any of the mamas out there about the strength of this muscle. It's so interesting because unlike when we contract our biceps uh, to li lift something up and to pick it up, the contractions that take place in labor and the delivery of a baby are entirely involuntary. And it starts doing the job the way it was designed to do. I can't tell you how many of the nurses encouraged Betty during her labor and kept saying stuff to her like, your body is made to do this. You can do this, Betty, they would say. Your body was designed to deliver a baby. 
And I thought in my mind, you know, these doctors have got to be believers in God. If they're saying things like this, I don't know if they believed in God or not, but I know one nurse definitely did. Because she was talking to Betty and she quoted the very verse as our title tonight. Psalm 139, verse 14. She said, don't worry. Your body was made to do everything it's going through right now, she reassured her. She said, we are just fearfully and wonderfully made, aren't we? I couldn't believe she had quoted this scripture. I knew she knew what she was talking about, where she got it from. And all these functions were working in Betty, and she didn't even know how it was happening. It was just happening. She wasn't in control of it. And I just say, what an awesome design from a very smart guy. Number three, of course, is the circulatory system. Does not the Bible itself state that the life of the flesh is in the blood? Leviticus 17 and verse 14. Sometimes we talk about how this knowledge was not known in modern science until very recently. Actually, the past 200 years did they actually verify that this had obviously been true all along. You remember how the first president of the United States died, as history tells us, George Washington? It was a common practice that when someone was sick, you would drain some of their blood in hopes of getting out the sickness. They had bad blood. They had dirty blood or whatever it was. They called it bloodletting. But when George Washington and others kept dying by this silly practice of draining people's blood, they're saying, we drain their blood and they die. I don't know what's going on. It turns out that Leviticus 17 and verse 14 was right all along, which had been written 4,000 years earlier by Moses. A person cannot live if you drain the blood out of their body. We know that as a fact now. Uh, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And so Moses knew that. But how did Moses know that, by the way? Was he a scientist, a practicing doctor who studied all these things and did experiments? No. What was so special about Moses is that God told him what to write. God told him these things. God knew because he designed the human body that flesh cannot live without his blood. If you drain his blood, the body's going to die. And he knew it long before modern science figured it out. And so with that being said, the circulatory system is an amazing system as any inside the body. I want to look at it. Yes, the skeletal system helps make us mobile. The muscular system uh, does the heavy lifting and the con contracting, but if it weren't for the blood that was flowing through the body all the time, none of your muscles, none of your organs or your bones would work because it is the fuel, it is the life to the flesh. Number four, I want to start talking about the circulatory system. Right? I don't want to stop talking about the circulatory system, but we need to move on really quickly to the respiratory system in order to keep talking about the circulatory system. We mentioned earlier that humans need what element to breathe? Oxygen. And so our respiratory system suctions in air from the outside world by inhaling. Your lungs work like a vacuum to inhale air from the outside world, and it brings it inside the body for you to use. And then some pretty amazing stuff starts taking place at the microscopic levels. And I want to talk about this. So little tiny particles of oxygen that are in the air outside are absorbed into what's called in the lung the alveoli. Uh, one web website said the alveoli are the very small air sacs where the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide take place. So this is an important spot in the body because something very important is happening here. So understand what's happening. Your blood is carrying carbon dioxide to your lungs from the rest of the body, which it needs to expel out of the body in some way because it is waste. It is something your body is not going to use anymore. And so in the lungs, the alveoli exchange the waste, the carbon dioxide, in exchange for the fuel, which is the oxygen. And so these little tree-like structures at the end of the bronchioles absorb the good stuff that your body is inhaling and it releases the bad stuff into the air so that you can exhale it out. So with every breath, you are intaking oxygen, the fuel, and expelling the waste, carbon dioxide. And by the way, do you remember that God designed trees just the opposite of that? For them, carbon dioxide is their fuel. Oxygen is their waste. 
which is interesting. And so each life source gives off what the other needs. We couldn't live on this earth without the plant. So going back to the circulatory system, which is your blood, your blood on a microscopic level is taking oxygen that is picked up at the lungs and it carries it then throughout the rest of the body to use it so that the body can have fuel and it will give you strength to do what all the other muscles are going to do. So do you see why the Bible says that the life of the flesh is in the blood? Because the blood carries fuel to the rest of the body. And the flesh, or if the flesh loses its blood, then no oxygen can be delivered to the rest of the body. And if no oxygen is delivered, the body will die. So your lungs wouldn't do you any good if it weren't for the circulatory system. If you took a deep breath, well, it wouldn't do you any good. If this exchange wasn't taking place in your lungs, sending it through your blood to the rest of your body, that's why we need to breathe. Oh, and at the center of this system is, of course, the heart itself. The blood pump, as many call it, is a muscle as well that is expanding and it's contracting for a specific purpose. It is pushing blood where it needs to go so that the oxygen that was just picked up at the lungs can then deli be delivered as fuel to the rest of the body so that it can operate. The heart then pushes the blood back towards the lungs so that it can drop off the waste, the carbon dioxide, and to pick up more fuel. So if you ever take your blood pressure, there's the high number on the top and the low number on the bottom. That's kind of where it comes from. Did you know that there are two sections, two of the four sections of your heart are working to push the blood enriched oxygen out, and that's the forceful one, uh, to the rest of the body. And then the other two sections are working to deliver carbon dioxide directly back to the lung. And so that's very complex, isn't it? Very interesting how we can just take a breath of air and then we can walk around. And all the while, they, this little electrical pulse is keeping your heart pumping and it's keeping your heart working. So consider this. How could, how could the lungs operate without the blood from the heart? And how could the heart operate without the blood from the lungs? And I say, it's just crazy, isn't it? It's almost like they were made and put together at the exact same time by a designer. And you know what's funny, I said this morning, you could get all the scientists in the world into one laboratory and they would have no idea how to recreate this mechanism in the flesh. Right, they can make machine pumps and artificial lungs, but they can't make them in flesh. There's only one, uh, there's only one place where these things can be produced and that is in the mother's womb. And that's where organs come from. That's where the human body is made. Nowhere else can it be done. So next, uh, again, we'll have to do both of these together uh, because they work in the same way. Number five is the digestive system, and number six is the urinary system. These are the systems by which your body receives some of its most powerful fuel, uh, fuel source, which is through food and water, food and drink. You know, Al talked to me before he got his kidney, kidney transplant. And, you know, at the time, he was being hooked up to a machine called a dialysis machine for hours a day just so that this machine could try to replicate what his old kidney had been doing by itself. But then it stopped working. And it's funny to me, when, when mankind makes something that replicates a function of the body, like a dialysis machine, performs the function of a kidney, Mankind is so proud of himself that they've created a machine by design and hard work. Right? How magnificent is the brain of the scientists who engineered and designed and built the dialysis machines so that they can perform the function of a kidney once it stops? That's an awesome brain. Somebody had to do that. Our brother Al would, uh, wouldn't be here today, really, if it weren't for magnificent minds like that. However, my question is, why is it considered a machine and a design when mankind replicates what God already made in the womb and in the human body? If this complex system is a design, then why is this complex system not a design? And by the way, Al would tell you that God's machine works way better than the doctor's because with the kidney that you get at your birth, you can walk around with it. And it's inside you all the time. And it's programmed to work all the time. 
So what do these two systems do, the digestive and the urinary system? They take the nutrients and the enzymes from the food that we eat and the liquids that we drink, and it absorbs it into the bloodstream. So there again, the circulatory system comes back into play. And then it sends it out to your muscles as fuel, and it extracts the waste. So our body was designed to suck out every ounce of energy from your food and your drink for energy for your body. And then our bodies extract, extract the leftovers into waste. So the digestive system gets rid of unused food. The urinary system gets rid of unused fluid. And we mentioned how, again, the energy is absorbed into the bloodstream. So we ask the question again, how could these systems function without the heart? And how could the heart function without these systems as fuel? They were put together at the same time, weren't they? But number seven is a very interesting one as well, the nervous system. This one is just as complex as all the others, if not the most complex. The electrical currents. There's electricity in your body helping this body move. Electric currents are, are sent from your brain, the command center, to the rest of the body. And it makes your muscles move and your organs work. Some functions of the body, your brain has to consciously think about like when I you know, raise up my arm to pick something up, or if I'm gonna go walk to my car, that's a voluntary uh, movement from your brain sent through your, uh, through your nervous system. Other functions, though, are involuntary, sent from your brain to make functions work. Like when the heart beats, and when the intestines digest for you, you don't have to think about those things, meaning your brain just does it for you talked earlier about how the skeletal system and the muscular system would not function without the other. But think about how the nervous system comes into play with all this. The nervous system is a network of little tiny strings coming out from your brain and going all over the body, kind of like the brain, the veins and the artery do from your heart. It goes all throughout your whole body. And those nerves carry the electrical currents sent from your brain with instruction and then the body follows the instructions sent from the brain. So the nerves trigger the muscles and triggers the bones, and thus the body can move. And the circulatory system, the respiratory system, the digestive and urinary system, make sure your muscles have energy to move. And so we learned that you know, all these systems really are working together as one, and one of them couldn't be there without the other because they work as a unit. All 10 of these need to be happening at the same time in order for any one of them to be able to be there and work. So thus, how could any of these systems exist without the other? So the big question is, how could these systems have possibly evolved from nothing and linked themselves together if there really was no God? Uh, number eight is an interesting one, is the lymphatic system, which is part of the immune system to help you from getting sick. I'm thankful for that one. A very important function when you stop and think about it. Number nine is the endocrine system, the system that produces and regulates different hormones in the body throughout your life. Now number 10 and lastly is the reproductive system, which is different in males and females. Genesis chapter two and verse seven, and the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Genesis 1.27 says, male and female. He created them. Among all of these other complex systems lies the ability to reproduce and to grow another human being with the same functions as ourselves. At conception, of course, God creates a new human soul, places it in the womb of a mother, and there's not a scientist in the world who can create such a body on its own with all ten of these systems that we've been talking about working as one. It is a design that the Bible says is very good. For God saw all the things that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The Bible said, God made us carefully and with much thought. We were fearfully and wonderfully made. We quoted this morning, Job said in Job chapter 10 and verse 8, when he was in the womb, he said to God, Your, your hands have made me and they have fashioned me as an intricate unity. And I think that tonight's lesson can attest to that, that it's all put together so fine-tuned, and we could not live if we hadn't been put together. Job 10, verse 11, said, Did you not clothe me with skin and flesh? 
and knit me together with bones and tendons. And then hopefully we can understand tonight the verse where it says, the fool is said in his heart, there is no God. We understand these things are all put together and why we're here and how we function. It's very care- a very careful design. If any scientist could replicate what we just talked about tonight in a robot, they would win the Nobel Peace Prize for their magnificent mind. And yet we all walk around with these systems every day and everybody scoffs at the idea that there's a designer. And so we understand that David said, no, I was fearfully, wonderfully made. So that's our lesson for tonight. Hopefully uh, we learned something new. Uh, if you've not been uh, pursuing your creator, you need to do so. The Bible says to, in order to go to heaven, to be with this creator, the source of all life, you've got to obey the gospel through Jesus Christ. You've got to hear the gospel, believe it, repent of your sins, confess him before men, and be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. And then we can have a home in heaven with our Creator after it's all over. We just need to remain faithful until death. So if anybody's not been remaining faithful and they need prayers or repentance as Christian, please come while we stand and sing. The times of-